it was a struggle due to the fact that there was a lack of hours. So yeah, that was my first pair of gloves, which were, that's brought back a nice memory. Players would run out um, and the coach would play out to either play off. Hello and welcome to the Daily Coaching Football Show, where we talk football, insight, player and coach development. This is your host, David Webb. And with me today, I have guest coach Gerald Lamy. Uh, Gerald, thank you for joining me and welcome to the show. Um, if you can, can you let the listeners and viewers know a little bit about yourself? No, pleasure. Thanks for having me on, David. Um, I'm excited about this one. Yeah, so, yeah, my name is Gerald Lamy. Um, I'm currently working towards my UEFA B. Um, my previous role was head coach of Juventus Academy in Oman, um, which I've just recently left the role. Um, I've been coaching full time for about six years now. Um, overall, I've been coaching for about eight to eight to I'd say eight to ten years, like coaching. Um, I've coached in the UK, I've coached in Italy, I've coached in Bahrain, um, and also in Oman. Um, yeah, that's a little bit of a a bit of small background of 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 you know what I've been doing. Cool, fantastic. Well, listen, Gerald, I'm looking forward to hearing your insight, your knowledge um, and your understanding of the game and specifically the coaching industry as well. So let's get into our first section of the uh, show, which is the discussion of the week. Okay, so first section of the show. So we're going to be looking at the discussion of the week. And this week's discussion is all around what is stopping young coaches and managers from progressing in the game in England. So Gerald, just taking a bit of an overview then, what, what do you kind of take away from that? What do you think as an overall could be the thing which is stopping young coaches and managers from progressing in England? I think this is a really good question, David, that you're asking because, um, again, I'm sure you can relate. Um, I've, I've been through the same thing where I remember when I was coming up, it was a struggle due to the fact that there was a lack of hours that was available to coach, um, the lack of even just you know, pay is, it's, it, even though that shouldn't be your main factor, but again, we've all got bills to pay with even just the fact that getting to the session could be a, a problem for some young coaches. Um, the amount of voluntary hours you have to put in um, and that doesn't even guarantee that you'll get a paid position anyway at the, at the end of the day. And I think, you know, again, going up the ladder, it, it's, it's a lot harder because you have ex-pros that would, you know, leave this, the, the game of playing um, and then maybe go down a coaching route and they'll get a position. So it's like they've really got a position there. By the time you got up the ladder, someone else is coming above you due to the fact of their playing career. And, you know, so there's a lot of factors that kind of, you know, make it a bit harder for young coaches to have that motivation to continue and keep going. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. I was I was one of those coaches. There was There was a time where... I wanted to give up also because um, I remember I was coaching with, with Arsenal and community and I was doing about, I think I was in my fourth month for voluntary. And I said, I can't do this anymore. You know, I'm, I'm in the rain. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing sessions sometimes at eight o'clock at night, finish at, you know, at 9 PM. By the time I get home, it's like 10, 11. And you're thinking I'd even get rewarded in, in terms of financially. However, what I would advise is like stick at it, keep going. Um, and, and you know keep keep pushing because something will come out of it if you really have the, the passion for it if we're talking about the elite level um, in particular the Premier League you know we've seen of recent Frank Lampard getting um, the, the sack at Chelsea I think you know the financial pressures that the Premier League brings is quite hard for young managers to have a long stint due to the fact that again if Chelsea didn't make the top four there's a huge financial dent within the club especially after spending 200 million so it's all about um i'd say it's about the the money that's being pumped in the premier league that will bring a lot of pressures to the young managers from the owners um and yeah you see examples of like in germany where um, nangelsman which we spoke about before where you know they're encouraged to um coach to make mistakes um and i think that all comes down to again culture where they really um, look look for young coaches to, to develop um, and also the financial strengths in Germany isn't as much as the Premier League there isn't as, as much pressure to perform um, and I feel like yeah that there's there's like Nang looking at Nangelsmann's um, process to where he is now he didn't get 
a job at Chelsea straight away, for example. Or, yes. you know, even though Frank did work through, you know, Derby, Derby's a huge club. There's a lot of pressures that come through there because they want to get promoted. And then he got the Chelsea job. So it's like there's a process when you from German coaches that we've seen from Jurgen Klopp that they've started at, you know, younger, uh, smaller clubs, mains and, and moved on and progressed to where he is now. So, yeah, I think... I think sometimes you put too much pressures on on the young coaches here in England to, to perform straight away, um, yeah. and we we look at it as you know they shouldn't be making mistakes, but that's all part of learning. So, yeah, cool. I think what's interesting as well is something which I have seen from England, and don't get me wrong, it's going in a good direction now in terms of there has been change being made. But you look at pathways now from a coach's aspect, we bang on so much about player pathways and you know yeah. making sure that there's. There's, a, there's steps in place for players to progress through each level, whether that be through grassroots, then obviously going maybe into your centre of excellence, in your academies, then obviously first teams, yeah. um, or even in terms of just the uh, type of training that they would, receive, they would receive. You know, more recreational, it's more about play, obviously more academy, it's more about tactics and technical type stuff. But I think when it comes to coaches, you don't actually get that. Like there's mm. no clear pathway, similar to what you said about the German aspect of things potentially. I mean, over in England, I mean, there was a big thing a couple of years ago where I think there was about maybe 1,000 to 2,000 people in England who had their UEFA B qualification. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think a hell of a lot less for UEFA A and pro licenses. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Spain, Germany, and I think possibly even Italy, there was, I think, you know, thousands. who Five, had 5,000, I think, in Germany. That was the yeah, number. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is, which is it's, in a way, I was going to say it's crazy. But in mm -hmm. a way, is good as well. Now, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. obviously, to be more competitiveness in, in terms of getting jobs and things yeah. like that. But because they've got a process and a correct pathway in place, mm -hmm. like you said, you're getting some of these uh, managers over in Germany and, and Italy and Spain who are climbing the ladder gradually. Mm -hmm. And number one, they're not getting as much pressure straight away mm -hmm. because obviously if you're at a, potentially, a, I say a smaller club, but maybe a club which is obviously not as financially great or um, are looking to achieve as many things, then you're getting the opportunity to actually develop yourself. And I think this is what yeah. a lot of people forget, that with players, we allow them to go out there, play and just progress and develop and learn and understand, you know, what to do within game. But when it mm. comes to coaching, it's so different because similar to schools, you look at your teacher and you expect them to know all the answers when, mm -hmm. you know, clearly that isn't always going to be the case. Um, you mentioned about money as well. Um, I think obviously that is a big thing as well when it comes down to it. But do you think there's a bit of a... Um, a sticky point really in terms of coaches pay so much money yep. to get these coaching qualifications and hopefully get these positions but then it's money again which is affecting them when they get these jobs because all of a sudden you know money is the thing which the clubs need money is the thing in which the clubs spend so then if it doesn't correlate between the two and the manager then they're out again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no I think I think it, again, it's a, going back to just initially what I said in terms of that, just to point out the voluntary part. Um, I'm not saying don't do it. I think that's a brilliant part of, you know, learning and making mistakes because there isn't as much pressure for you to go and do that. Um, so I'll definitely recommend any of the coaches to go through that sort of experience and then obviously work up the ladder. Um, in terms of the, the the money situation, do you mean by it in terms of that the elite game of the owners spending money? Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting because, like I said, obviously, a, a, young, oh, a younger stage, a uh, starting out area I've been coaching, obviously, you pay a lot of money to get your coaching yeah. qualifications. Yeah. Now, obviously, yeah. in the elite stage, not all of those players or coaches we'll have to pay, pay yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But when it comes to the elite stages, yeah, you know, like you said, there's obviously the, the strains of actually getting into mm. certain positions for money. Mm. There's the attraction from players as well for, again, spending yeah. money in the correct manner. Do you almost feel as well that with that, you know, we're not just looking at coaches here. We're just kind of looking at individuals and they have to have so many sort of strengths to their, their game. Because remember, there's mm -hmm. not as many managers now. A lot of yeah. these positions are now head coaches mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than managers. So, mm. yeah. yeah I, think, I, I think it's changed just because of the fact that, you know, again, you know, the, the, the conventional manager, you, you have so much responsibility, so much roles yeah. where the game has changed. It's added so much different parts to it, like, you know, data analysis, uh, the nutrition side of things. Um, overall, just looking after a project is can be quite strenuous to a manager where you lose focus of the team. Whereas yeah. now we've seen that change where it's like you are predominantly just leading the team. Don't worry about the off the field stuff. 
we have other people in position to do that. Um, so I think that's that's where you know we've seen that change. Um, and going back to the other question, where you said in terms of spending money on um, qualifications, for me again, it's like you invest so much into something, and it's not guaranteed that you yeah. are going to get a paid position after this. Um, which if, I don't think there's any other industry like that. I'm not too sure like where you can spend so much money. I mean, obviously uni um, and going to places like that, it's not guaranteed that you will get a job, but you know, you've got some sort of education or something to fall back on. Whereas with football, it's like, it, it, that doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a position anywhere um, yeah. because there's so much factors that play into it. Um, but again, this is where sometimes your network is your net worth, as they say, you know, we've seen yeah. it in the past where, some people get positions and because of who they know and things like that. So yes, it's, um, it's an interesting debate, which we could go on for hours and hours. And I'm sure everyone has different opinions on it. Yeah. It's interesting because as well, just because you were saying about, like you said, you know, network, network sort of thing. Um, you mentioned about a lot of ex players potentially going into mm -hmm. the game and, you know, we're looking at it kind of from two aspects here. So we're looking at it from the, um, you know, the coaches who maybe haven't played the game at such an elite yeah. level going into it. So are they being potentially blocked out of positions because of names? Now, let's be honest, you know, I know you support Arsenal and, yeah. you know, if you say, for example, were given an option and you obviously have a platform on social media, say, for example, and someone said to you, look, you know, you could get in um, coach grassroots or you can get in Carlo Ancelotti you know, you're probably more swayed toward Carlo Ancelotti because of potentially a proven record. I mean, mm -hmm. let's be honest, like you said about comparing it to different industries, you know, if, if in any other job you want to try and get somebody in to maybe run your company or be a manager within your company, within a team, you get someone based on their previous experiences. Mm -hmm. But the challenge then is, if you don't have previous experiences, how do you get an opportunity to yeah. actually grow? So like mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned before, having this sort of network that you may have around you or contacts that you may have within the game, I think that definitely does help. But then the problem is, I think because of names and fan pressure and social media pressure, mm -hmm. these names are the ex-pros. Mm -hmm. So the ex-pros are then getting the positions. But then I think it's a three-step process. Like I said, you go into it thinking, have I got the connections? Have I got the network? If you've got that, you then get the positions. If you're an ex-pro, and you've got those positions, you're then under a lot of pressure because your potential hype from when you were a player, mm -hmm. but then you have the expectations as well of, like we said, somebody like a Carlo Ancelotti, who's got the CV, he's got everything mm -hmm. on his CV, he's done it all. So he can just be that person on the outside and who can be like, well, I've got all these qualifications, I've got all this experience, I'm potentially right for the job. And I think we mm -hmm. see it so often now with a lot of like, they call it the, uh, the circle of, of, of managers where yeah. you know, you've got your Alan Pardews, your Sam Allardyces, and those sort of people. And they're almost taking up the positions of these roles in these jobs because they have experience. But, mm -hmm. you know, give something to somebody who's been in the game for a couple of years or not even a year, potentially. Um, I've, I've known many who have gone in at maybe lower league clubs and they haven't done as well as they wanted to. And then they're out straight away. And because mm -hmm. they haven't got the name and because they haven't built up that experience, they're out on their feet. And then, like you said, if you're obviously spending a lot of money towards something, investing towards something, it's then like, well, where do I go from here? So mm -hmm. I think that fans and social media can definitely be a hype because, yeah. you know, names are something which we all get buzzed off of that. And when we mm -hmm. hear somebody who's linked to our club, you know, you can't help but get excited almost. Yeah, no, for sure. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. I think, again, those names that you mentioned, like the Sam Allardyce, I feel the reason why they continue to get these jobs is because, like you said, they have a proven track record. And it's not just on the pitch, off the pitch as well. I'm sure, you know, these guys will know how to handle, you know, staff. They'll know how to handle, like, certain times with the books. You know, these are old school managers that have dealt with the overall project. Whereas if you get a young manager coming into to the, to the picture, for instance, like when Arteta first came at Arsenal, um, at first I wasn't, I wasn't sure whether or not he'll be up for the job, um, whether he's good enough. As a coach, we heard great things about him, you know. But you yourself, you know, being a coach and being a manager is two different things. Yeah. Managing a project is so much different because 
Like, and we've seen it with him where he's had some problems off the pitch when it comes to managing players, which is something, again, he's going to have to learn. However, Arsenal's a huge club. Again, this is where the pressures come into it because fans expect um, more than what, what's actually delivered. Um, the board also, in terms of the finances and things like that, they expect a lot more. So that pressure comes into it. Whereas if, for instance, Arteta went to like, I don't know, maybe a, a team in Spain, um, maybe a Real Sociedad or something like that, maybe the pressures aren't as high, you know, for him to perform yeah. um, to that level. So that's where you can make some mistakes. That's where you can grow. That's where you can learn and then maybe take the Arsenal position. So I don't know. Only time will tell whether or not he will be able to, you know, um, prove the doubt was wrong. Obviously, he's won the FA Cup already. But again, that was like, I think he only had to play three games to get to the final or three, four games. So, but yeah, I think I think this is the reason why these managers do get the jobs because of the fact that, you know, it's not just man, it's not just coaching that they're doing. It's the overall package of, of managing a club. And I feel like owners feel more secure at the end of the day. That's what they want to feel. They want to feel secure when they bring somebody yeah. in. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting, again, just to see different perspectives of, you know, owners, um, people's cultures' perspective to see, yeah. you know, what they think about it as well. Yeah, cool. And, and as well, the final point on this discussion, which I kind of wanted to pick up on, is expectations. Now, mm. I think sometimes, I mean, listen, we've all been young, we've all played things like football manager. And we've always yes. wanted to take the, you know, the non-league clubs or the lower league clubs and try and see if we can build them all the way up. Now, you look at, say, for example, somebody like two people I've thought of my head, like Eddie Howe or Danny Cowley, and, you know, you think, well, like, well, well done. They've created such a legacy for themselves in terms mm -hmm. of getting clubs from lower league levels, building them up. And in a way, I suppose that's them building that CV, that's them gaining that experience. But then the club and the manager kind of gets to a level where there's a certain expectancy now of that mm -hmm. individual or of mm -hmm. that club. And I wanted to kind of think or discuss, do you think sometimes, and it's tough because in England, we seem to hate the word fail or failure. We, mm -hmm. seem, we reflect on that as a negative. And I always say to a lot of players that, you know, failing, I don't know what the abbreviation is, but it's about learning. You know, failing is an opportunity first attempt, to learn. Yeah, first attempt to learn it. Yeah, exactly. And I think sometimes, like, you know, we shouldn't see it as a failure. We should actually see it as what has been the successes. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes as well, when, you know, we think about what's blocking people from progressing, what does progressing actually even mean? Because, mm -hmm. you know, is progressing getting, like we said, that football league club all the way up into a Champions League place and, mm -hmm. you know, going on doing great things? Or is progressing developing a player who then you sell, who then goes on to achieve great things in the game? is developing being able to build relationships on the pitch with your team. Like you said, so much of it's about the off-the-pitch stuff. Is it somebody like Sir Alex Ferguson, who, you know, they always said wasn't necessarily a great coach, but mm -hmm. he actually managed that club and dealt with so many of the other issues. So when it comes down to expectations of the individual and of the individuals mm -hmm. in the role, do you kind of feel that, you know, this is something which you almost are your own worst enemy? Because if you build up your expectations too much, then all those external people and factors then start to filter in. And, and, and what would you classify progress as? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's interesting because, again, the Eddie Howes of this world, he's done an amazing job getting a Bournemouth to what, League, I think they were League Two at that time, yeah. all the way to the Premier League. So it's like, sometimes for me, it's like, is it time to move on? I felt like there was a time where he should have moved on and said, I've done the best that I can because then you expect more from me where I can't give anymore. I've done the best that I can. I've taken him from League Two to the Premier League. We've, we've been a, a, a team that stayed in the Premier League for a couple of years. There's not much else that I can do. Someone else, I have to pass the torch on to somebody else to take over. Maybe with more experience in the Premier League, then can I move on to another team in the Premier League who maybe are in and about of the mid-table team, you know. So can I challenge myself even more and put myself under more pressure? So it's like I've helped the club progress. Now I'm progressing myself as well to go into that yeah. next level. And I feel like, for example, the, the, the Frank Lampard situation, was he a failure? Was he a, not a failure? Like, or did he have some sort of progress, you know, the stats show that he's probably the, you know, in terms of win game ratio, has been the worst manager in, 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 you know, Chelsea's history and things like that. However, I feel like him 
as a coach, he can definitely say that he's learned a lot. There's progress within yeah. him because of certain situations, maybe like, again, going back to the word, the managing, because coaching is one thing and managing is a different thing. There's probably things that he can take forward and say, you know what, maybe I should have handled that in a different way. So that's progress for him. In terms of the club, he introduced the young players coming through to the club, whether that's been because of they were forced to do it or not. That's another conversation. But he was in, he introduced the young policy um, of players that they've had for years, but they just yeah. never used them. Do you know what I mean? So it's like the Mason Mounts playing regular football. Uh, Reese James started coming into play. Uh, Tammy Abrams was playing regular football, even though he was dropped a few times. But again, it's it's for me that's progress. You know whether or not he made it to I don't know winning a trophy for them. That's that's a different thing, and yeah, it's different. And it, that goes with Oli as well. Yeah, the same thing with Oli, where people are saying, is it is it is it a good thing that he's doing at the moment? Is it not? So far, he's he's doing what, in my opinion, he's doing well. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not the biggest fan of, you know, Oli in terms of just his style and things like that. However, that's not for me to judge. Do you know what I mean? That's that's his way of doing it. Um, and he's done well. He's definitely done well. So, it's, it, again, for me, it, it's individual and also as a collective in terms of, like, progress. Um, sometimes it's not always about trophies. We've seen with Brendan Rodgers, for example, at Liverpool, he got the team to a certain level. He didn't win the league with them. However, he built a structure. He built a foundation for the team. And we've heard Jurgen Klopp say, you know what, when I came into here, there was a, there was a structure, there was a foundation. Yeah. That comes down to Brendan Rodgers. So it's for a club, it's more so about the bigger picture. And, and I'm sure, again, Brendan Rodgers learned a lot to where he is now in Leicester. We've seen he's reaping the benefits for, for the experiences that he's had. So, you know, fans want to see trophies. Fans want to see marquee signings. Fans want to see the glory days, but it's behind the scene that, you know, is, is the building blocks. So yes, it's a tough one. It's a, you won't understand until you are behind the scenes and, and you're fully in there. And I think, you know, documentaries, when we spoke on my podcast with the, the Tottenham documentary, where yeah. even though it's entertainment, you still see a little bit behind the scenes of what's going on. And I think that's what's important for fans to start watching those things and, and, you know, understanding that it's, it's, it's a whole operation and there's so much factors that come into it. And at the end of the day, these are our human beings just like everybody else. Everyone's got something going on um, and sometimes it can come into work. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Good no, question. 100%. I like it. No, no, I think, I think it's an important debate. I think, you know, it's something which, like I said, we, we see so much from a media aspect now, but I think you hit the nail on the head of fantastic sort of overview of it or evaluation of it where you said, you know, about individuals and collectives. I think, you know, there is that that versus there, the individual journey, the collective mm -hmm. in terms of the overall uh, size, image, portrayal of the club. But then also as well, I think there is a bit of a debate for the individual strands of, you know, grassroots journey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just coaches progressing through their qualifications and potentially new roles that they may take on. And then obviously the elite game. But yeah, I think there's an interesting debate. And I think, again, it's something which, you know, there is no sort of golden answer to, but, um, you know, listen, people who are watching and listening to this, it'd be great if you could leave your comments um, below and let us know your thoughts um, around, you know, what is stopping coaches and managers um, from progressing within England um, and share your thoughts and your opinions on this as well. Um, but yeah, fantastic insight into that discussion. Okay, so next up on the show, we've got the dream five-a-side team to coach. Okay, so we're going to ask Gerald what his dream five-a-side team is to coach and why he would like those five players to coach, thinking of all those coaching aspects in terms of the four corners, the physical, technical, psychological, social reasons. Um, and obviously, there may be a bit of biasness in there as well because, you know, <laughs> he's an Arsenal fan. Uh, but Gerald, over to you. What is your five-a-side dream team? Yeah, I'm excited about this one, to be fair, David. Um... So what I've gone for, this is currently, um, if we're talking about overall, then that's a whole other team that we have to construct. But this is, you know, currently who I would pick. Um, the reason why I have gone for this team is because there's a mixture of balance, of um, experience and also youthfulness. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll go through it now. For me personally, again, this, this guy is number one goalkeeper in the world is Manuel Neuer. I think... I think people still look past him. You know, this guy's still winning Champions Leagues, you know, till now. He's won the World Cup. He's won the European Cup. Like, he's a decorated um, 
the goalkeeper to the point where he's even um, we've even named the position after him sometimes of him coming out and being that extra play on, on the field in terms of helping out the team. So, um, yeah, for me, I think his experience is vital um, to the team. He can lead from the back. Um, and also, if, if, if back passes are allowed, I'm not too sure if back passes are allowed, but if they're allowed, he's not too bad on his feet as well. So he can, he'll be able to play. He's technically good enough also. Um, the next one I'm going for, uh, a defender. Again, another one, experience. So at the back, for me, experience is vital. Um, that's the foundation. That's the root. Um, when you build a house, you need to have a strong foundation. And, you know, for me, these two are, are, are going to be, you know, holding the team up. So the next one I've gone for is Sergio Ramos. Again, another one who's just decorated, experienced. He's got the physique till now. He's, you know, he's, he's an older player, but he's still looking after his body. He brings that winner's mindset, that winner's mentality to the team. Um, he's, an, he's an intelligent player as well. I think, you know, he can play with the team. He can interchange. And as a defender... You know, we know he scores a lot of goals and then five aside, there's a lot of interchanging. So if he does get in front of goal, I'm sure he can he can nick a few goals for us as well. So, yeah, man. So I'm going for Sergio Ramos um, in, in defence for me. Um, moving on to my two midfielders. Again, someone who's just, for me at the moment, probably the best midfielder in the world. Um, and that's KDB. Um, Kevin, Kevin De Bruyne at Man City. Technically, just up there you know we've seen the passes that you can make um you'll be able to play those deadly passes in between gaps as the vision to create something for us as well um he works hard you know five aside again it's, it's constant there's a lot of running about so i need players to be to be running on, on a consistent basis and he'll bring that so come end of the game i need to see those cheeks red from him then i'll know he's had a good game <laughs> so yeah <laughs> so yeah I'll, I'll go for kdb uh, my other my other midfielder um, slash forward more so I'll give him a free well there's not really a free roll on five aside but I'll give him a bit a little bit more freedom um, is Sancho Jaden Sancho just because yeah. um, he'll bring that youthfulness he'll bring um, the dribbling ability to go past players again creativity skills um, be able to play in tight spaces um, yeah and I just think he'll bring that 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 sw- that little bit of swagger to the team. Um, and yeah, he'll keep those old boys on, the, on, on their toes as well, the Sergio Ramos and Neuer. Um, and then for my forward, again, there's a lot of interchanging. You can change with Sancho, KDB, um, is Kylian Mbappe. Um, again, brings that youthfulness. He's won the World Cup. He's won the European Cup. Like He's, he's a big game player. Um, again, a bit of speed. I'm not too sure how, how big this five-a-side is, but if there's space in the tw- <laughs> behind... He can definitely um, stretch the defence, but he can also play. He can dribble past players. Um, so in terms of like the technical aspect, again, the winner's mindset, he, he's definitely got that. Um, so yeah, I think I've got to make sure they have leaders, um, technical ability, um, Sergio Ramos in terms of that physical aspect as well. Um, and then the social aspects of like Sancho and Bappe, I think they'll bring that that fun element. So yeah, I think I think I think I've done well there, David. I think I've done well. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I like I like it. I think, like you said, it's interesting because you've obviously got that back. I say back line, obviously the goalkeeper and the defence. Um, and what's interesting is that there's um, you know, often sort of when we talk about defenders and and obviously goalkeepers, you tend to think of people who are experienced. Mm-hmm. You know, you tend to think that they're your key technical points within your pitches, really. Whereas, like you said, you know, potentially your Kevin De Bruyne, your Jaden Sancho, your Mbappe's you allow them a bit more freedom on the pitch mm-hmm. and a bit more creativity. And I think that's obviously definitely something which you've seen coming to the game more in the last few years. But I think mm-hmm. I really like that balance between the two because you do, you need obviously creativity, you need freedom, you need expression, but you also need those people in there who can pull in the reins a little bit and, you know, you know, get people organised. And I think that's such an underestimated thing in this day and age that we talk mm-hmm. about creativity all the time. But organisation is so key there. It's interesting, obviously, to see how you got that sort of like, you know, um, o- overload almost in the midfield area. Because obviously, mm-hmm. if you're stopping people from, from coming through, you've got somebody like Sergio Ramos at the back. Obviously, you're a bit more confident of doing that. Um, but interesting as well, you talk about the sort of like, you know, the manual noise, the sweeper keeper type mm-hmm. role. Um, do you think that's something which coaches enjoy 
bringing out because you know again sometimes you know you have the coaches who will you know score me goals if you're a striker save me goals if you're a goalkeeper as a coach how do you sort of like to implement your goalkeeper into your team because we often forget about them when we talk about in 11 aside we say what's your formation Four four two. Mm-hmm. Well, you've only got ten players playing. Where's the other player? You, yeah, you, yeah. People forget about the goalkeeper. For you, how important is it that when you have a goalkeeper in a team, you integrate them within your team and the way you like your team to play? Yeah, I think it's huge. I think we've seen the the um, there's there's that new term now where they're speaking about it's one four four two um, rather yeah. than it just being four four two. So I think that's important to to make them feel included because you know straight away they've got a different kit to everybody else you know it, they already feel like they're different you know they can use their hands compared to other people so automatically they, they they're a different um, role to the team um, so it's important to, to make them feel like they are part of the team they, they can you know be part of you know maybe a goal or starting a goal you know the start of yeah. a build-up which for me I'm, I'm a huge believer in that where you know if we can keep the ball at all times and that, that includes the goalkeeper. You know, we've seen, I think there was a clip that's going on around uh, Sevilla and it scored an amazing goal, which was like, for me, I was panicking. I was like, no, 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 get, like, just what are you guys doing? But again, it's that comfortability of players, you know, trying and, and it's not always going to work out. Sometimes they're going to make a mistake and the keeper's going to make a mistake and maybe uh, lead to a goal because for me, the keeper sometimes is the start of an attack. Most yeah. of the time, for me personally, anyway, to be fair. So, yeah, in my culture, I'm always trying to implement goalkeepers, um, whether that's, uh, again, we're going to speak about it a bit later on in terms of a session. But, yeah, just in every part of the session, can we involve the goalkeepers? Because um, I, I, I don't want them to feel like, all right, cool, you lot, the goalkeepers, go there to the corner. There's times that you all have to do that because you're going to be working on goal, goalkeeper-specific training. But um, for me, it's, it's important to make them feel part of the team and yeah we've seen it we've seen it you know the the, the likes of Neuer that's changed the game you know sometimes we yeah. see him in the centre midfield which is crazy but yeah I'm not too sure I'll be able to, to <laughs> be calm on the touchline see my goalkeeper halfway through the park but um, yeah no it's important huge hugely important in my in my coaching aspect Cool. And, and then just two points as well. Again, I really like the um, attacking element of your team. And like I said, that the, the players that you've got in there, you know, they're players that play with, you know, freedom. They're very creative on the ball. The brainers, obviously, not only being creative, but in terms of, you know, can pick moments, he's mm. visionary and his awareness um, and his reactive skills are unbelievable. Um, how important is it for you as a coach as well that with when sort of building a team, whether that be elite or sort of like, you know, you're just building the foundation of a team, that number one, you have those creative players in there. Because mm. like you said, sometimes like the Seville incident, you know, you panic almost as a manager or as a coach, but sometimes... You know, the Mavericks within the team, sometimes yeah. the uh, players with creativity can produce things that nobody else can. So how important mm-hmm. is it for you to have creativity? And also, um, I kind of like the way as well in which, you know, you're Jaden Sancho and Kylian Mbappe, you know, um, you could even include, obviously, Rashford and obviously in your team. But those yeah. sort of three players all coming through similar age groups, similar sort of pathways. How important do you feel relationships are within teams? So like you said, you've got your Neuer and your Ramos, your mm-hmm. two experienced people at the back. You've got your Mbappe and your uh, Sancho, two young up-and-coming players. Yeah, so creativity and relationship, how, how important is that for you and your, your team? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's hugely, again, because if you're looking at positions, if you're looking at the defence, like we spoke a bit earlier on, where you know you, you, it's more so like the sensible players or the, most, the more experienced players, they're well-organised, they're hard to break down. So to counter-attack that, you need a creative player. Otherwise, if yeah. you have an organised striker and an organised defender that they're up against, then there's not really much that's going to happen. They're only going to be clashing with each other rather than, you know, can we find the spaces in behind? Um, can we try and pick them out when, you know, when they might have switched off? And you need creative players to do that, you know. Um, and I think that's hugely important for me personally to, to let those players have that freedom because, like you said, you are up. You are up against players that sometimes are very sturdy. They're they're strong, like the Ramos is. You need you need creativity to beat him. Um, yeah. So yeah, for me, it's, it's hugely important. And and I feel like those players need to be given that freedom to express themselves. I'm not too sure. In grassroots, I've, I've like personally, I've seen a few coaches that are like always like, can you pass? Can you pass? Make sure you pass. And I'm like, 
well, uh, are we really creating any creative players from just saying, can we pass? I know football is a, is a team sport, but there are times where maybe the pass isn't the best option there. Maybe can I beat this player yeah. and then create a 2v1 option for my team? We've created an overload for me just going past this player. Otherwise, if we're passing, 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 like sometimes, are we really going anywhere? So for me personally, when I, when I do coach, um, especially when we're in a, the, the final third of the pitch um, to try and score goals, it's about letting players be creative, be what, how can we try and score a goal? And sometimes it's like, okay, you figure it out. You, you come up with yeah. a solution. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's hugely important for me. It also makes the game fun to watch. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I think sometimes watching the game, for me personally, sometimes I sit down, I watch a lot of games, I do watch a lot of games and I try and study as much as I can and, and, and watch how teams set up. And for me, it's like, sometimes it can be too rigid where it's like, it has to be one way, it has to be this way. And, you know, seeing teams like, I love watching Leicester. You yeah. know, that the, the creative players like the Harvey Barnes, James Madison, um, even Yuri Tillmans. I think those players are exciting to watch. Um, and I feel like Brendan Rodgers gives those players the, the freedom to express themselves when they do get on the pitch. Um, so, yeah, no, that's one team that I've definitely looked forward to, to watch a week in and week out. <laughs> nice. I think as well, sorry, just to pick up on the creativity element of it, I think what's kind of interesting about creativity as well is that you know, or you talked about potentially allowing players to make decisions and become problem mm. solvers. And I think that sometimes you get the experienced professionals mm. who will make decisions and are usually the decision makers, but they're basing it on previous experiences because they've yeah. played up just over such a long time. Whereas mm. the younger ones, obviously, don't get me wrong, they're basing it on previous experiences of different environments. So obviously, younger age groups. But what I think is interesting as well is, you know, you need new artists. You know, you can't always yeah. have the same pictures being painted. Mm -hmm. And I think what these young players bring, and they, they bring obviously this creativity, but they bring these new paintings and they paint new pictures on the pitch. And I think that's obviously which creates better decision makers because not only are they based on experiences, but they're also basing it on the situations and scenarios which they find themselves in. So I think not it's a... Sure. An interesting one but no listen fantastic team um i don't know if i was another opposition manager if i'd want to come up against that, uh, that five. Um, i think we'll do all right i think we'll do all right <laughs> but yeah no it's a fantastic team but again listen viewers and listeners uh obviously in the comments below make sure you put your five aside team that you would love to coach um if you're a player potentially your five aside team that you'd love to play within um and we'll see whether or not your uh team can match up against uh gerald's team and see how they get on. But no, fantastic insight into your, your five-a-side team to coach. Oh, brilliant. So this week's special guest, I'm joined by a professional who has played in over 600 games as a player, playing for clubs such as Portsmouth, Millwall and Cambridge, and also representing the Republic of Ireland on the international stage. I'm delighted to be joined by ex-goalkeeping legend, David Ford. As a goalkeeper, can you remember what the first pair of gloves was you had and when you got them? And at that stage, did you know that you wanted to be a goalkeeper or was it kind of just part of, you know, the football attire, as you want to call it? First pair of gloves I had were actually, and I remember them so well, they were an amazing pair of gloves. They were Umbro and they were Umbro Bruce Grobblers. And you can actually, if you go online, you can actually search them up and type in Umbro Bruce Grobblers and they were they were red and a luminous yellow and green and black. And they had a lit on the index finger. They had a picture of Bruce Grobler arched diving to make a save. And nice. oh, they were they were absolutely amazing. They were some some piece of kit and they were my absolute pride and joy. You know, I probably would have slept with them. I probably would have ate with them. <laughs> did, did everything with them, like you know. And uh, then there was also another in in that in that that just reminds me as well. I, I think there were I, I so enjoyed the the Umbro gloves at that stage that there was a Packy Bonner um, Celtic edition and they had the the green and yellow and the green and white of of of, um, of Celtic and stuff. So as an Irish lad, they were they were probably two of the the biggest clubs at the time. Um, and for me, it was it was absolutely everything. So yeah, that was me me first pair of gloves, which were. That's brought back a nice memory. Was there any particular goalkeeper that kind of stood out for you and you thought, you know what, I would love to be like that goalkeeper. I want to really aspire to be like them. I was a, I was a massive fan of David James growing up. Yeah. I, I loved I loved David James um, when when he was when when he was playing, and um, 
he there was there were so many keepers even before that. And it, it's hard to really say, it's hard to really answer that question because I love goalkeeping. I love the whole art of goalkeeping. I love the whole science behind goalkeeping. It was amazing to look back at that time. Likes have said Bruce Grobler, he was he was he was amazing. He was so agile. And I had I had so many different keepers for so many different reasons because they had so many different attributes that I, I enjoyed about them. Um yeah. Walter Zenga, I loved Walter Zenga, the Italian great Inter Milan. Um who else was there? Let me see. Um uh, Peter Schmeichel. Peter Schmeichel was an absolute boss man, probably if not the best goalkeeper. And the only disdain I had for him was because he was Man United. But <laughs> really, secretly I'd say nothing, like, you know. And then when the first time I remember seeing him throwing a ball over the halfway line, I thought, this is actually insane. He's after throwing a ball from the 18-yard box over the halfway line, which was insane at the time. It was unheard of. Um, so, yeah, there was, there's, there's been so many great keepers. Steve Grizovic, when he was at Coventry, David Seaman. There's, and, you know, there's been always a great tradition of, of Irish goalkeepers, the likes of... Um, Alan Kelly, I was a big fan of Alan Kelly, and then I got to work with Alan Kelly. That was amazing. Shea Given, um, and you know, and even you look at the the great tradition of of English goalkeepers down through the years. The likes of um, Peter Shilton, hearing the story about him swinging from the rafters or swinging from his banister. My dad makes a brand new shed, and I'm out the back garden swinging from the rafters <laughs> like a bonobo, trying to grow a few inches, and my arms getting longer, and just little things like that, like you know, and. It was such a it was such a fun time. It was such a it was such a, a a great great time. Like you know, and looking back at you know, when I think of 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 you know acts of brilliance, and there's probably none better than Gordon Banks was safe at the World Cup. That if you yeah. were probably tried to do it again, or if you probably tried to do it again, you know, it's it's, it's it was some it was spectacular, absolute some safe. You know, it's amazing. Um, was there ever a stage? I know you said obviously you always wanted to be a goalkeeper, but say for example if you couldn't be a goalkeeper for whatever reason and maybe that wasn't the, the pathway in which your career took. Was there any other positions in which you kind of really sort of felt a close relationship with? I'd always have to crack. I'd always have to crack if I ever went out, out, out field and say, feed the bear, like, you know. And uh, <laughs> they'd probably uh, touch on me like a JCB, like, but... Um, my my position really and what why I had an affinity towards is probably and what comes to mind is I the number four. I used to love that number four, that holding midfield role. Um, you know, that holding, you know, that kind of aggressor, that type of, you know, you can assert yourself on the game, you can crawl the game, you can move it about, you can be so influential and so part of the game. And that was a big part of me as a goalkeeper, I found very difficult was because I was a quite a vocal presence and I, I love being in the mix of things. By being a keeper is, you know, what you, you can't actually involve yourself too much. So um, I love that whole aspect of, right, if I'm in the mix of it, I can keep my full concentration and focus here and get yourself about. And that probably came about through my GEA background, playing centre midfield in, in Gaelic football. And I, ju I just love that whole aspect of it. And it was amazing as well for the, the skills and the attributes that... Um, intertwined with, with soccer as well because you know as a goalkeeper more or so was fielding high balls under pressure from from four or five other players and just the whole sense of physicality of it I just lived for all that kind of thing like so then to go back into goals where you were being so involved in the mix and in the center of everything to be on the periphery and then to be called on at certain times and spaces it was just a whole different type of challenge a whole different type of experience but it was um yeah, it's uh, it came to a stage where I was like, right, I've, I've got Gaelic football here or I've got, do I want to be, you know, a goalkeeper? And my whole dream was always to play for Ireland. So I just came to that stage as you normally do, maybe 14, 15, and you have to make a decision whether that's tennis or um, hockey or whatever sport you're actually into, whatever sports you're into. Um, you have to make that decision. So I made that decision probably around then, around 15. I was like, right, I'm, I'm going to put my head down here and... Um, do my best to, to, to make it as a professional goalkeeper. What was the one thing for you which you just loved the most about playing football? Was it the whole element of being in goal? Or was it just the fans or was it the, the stadiums? Or what, what was that one thing that just blew your mind? There's so many, so many elements to that. There's so yeah. many elements. But I, I believe the one that trumps all that is the camaraderie, is the unity and the togetherness of coming together as a team. And that being in that challenge and being under so much pressure and coming out victorious, 
and it's a total peak experience and that it, it, it's for me it sums up you know the beauty of the human spirit you know that yeah. people can come together share a common goal and go to work together and then achieve it and you know understanding the challenges that you're faced with that and you overcome them internally as well as well as all the external forces that are coming in on top of that and you actually realize that you know any any time I've been in successful teams and I've often said that is it's probably happened to me maybe three times in in a whole career that I can look back on a team that I can actually genuinely call brothers that's been part of a fraternity that's been part of you know I think I think of you know, they even wrote a book on it on, on the family about Millwall and that whole experience yeah. and what that was actually like for a group of lads to come together. And, you know, that 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 bond was so, so tight and we, it, it made us, you know, it, it overcompensated for everything else that we were lacking, whether it was ability or quality or whatever that actually is. That sense of unity trumped everything else. It was absolutely massive. And I've had it probably at Portsmouth when we, we got promoted and won the league. Um, and at Derry City when I was back playing in, in, in the League of Ireland when uh, um, now Stephen, Ma- Stephen Kenny, the current Ireland manager, was, was at the helm and stuff. And we just a special, special bond, uh, bond of players. And, and that, that is so special because when you look back at times in football and, you know, everybody has a perception that, that football is, is rosy all the time. It's probably rosy percent for about ten percent of it. The rest of the ninety percent is is serious hard work, a lot a lot of hard work, and there's more more downs than there is actually ups. So yeah. when we start to look at it from from that perspective, and what keeps us together is is that sense of, um, as I said, that sense of that sense of sense of that sense of hood or whatever that actually is, like you know. Yeah, have you got sort of any sort of uh, songs which you can remember which were ever put on before a game in preparation for a match or? Were you ever given the opportunity to put any sort of music or any sort of rituals before a game started in the change room from, from your own experiences? Yeah, for, for years it was it was always, as you said, the playlist. And and then, you know, it, it some some playlists were are absolutely horrific. Some <laughs> music was absolutely brilliant. And because you have such a diversity within the team, you know, you'd have had some old players and they're into seventies and eighties. Some players that are into hip hop R and B, some people that are into rave, some people are hardcore, you know, hardcore dance music. There's so many different things, and then you hear the music come on, and it, it, there was a bit of fun in it as well because there was a bit of banter and a bit of crack of like what you're listening to is absolutely crap, and you know, it generates that bit of fun and turn the next song off and turns it off, and someone's raging, and they're like, "That's my song," and so there was years where a manager would be like, "Right." you all get a chance to, to pick your song and play your song or whatever it actually is and stuff like, you know. And then what happened was then usually the, the bad ones then were probably edited to the end, so we probably never got a chance or an opportunity to hear those songs. Um, oh, Jesus, there's been, there's been so many songs down, down, down through the ages. You know, there's been so many different songs um, that it's hard to actually, it's hard to um, pinpoint any, pinpoint any one song. Yeah, so... Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm 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 a lover of all all types of music, you know. Whether that's I listen to a fair bit of country and western music at the moment. No. I love whether it's the Bee Gees to Oasis to U2 to to jazz music to whatever. I love I love I love all types of music. So yeah. I think it just <laughs> just me uh, me me Celtic Irish background. Yeah. Like I said, you know, you've had a, a, an amazing career. Obviously, you know, playing through different teams both at club level and international level as well. Um, kind of looking across sort of like, you know, all the environments in which you've been within. Um, again, a bit of another fun one, really, I suppose. Um, if you were, say, for example, captain um, and you got brought down to your five-a-side local power league pitches, who would you kind of bring with you and put in that team in terms of players that you've been able to play with, whether that be technically wise or, like you said, maybe that connection that you've been able to build through through brotherhood yeah if i if i was to look back at, at probably a five side team and you know some of the players i was blessed enough to play with um and i probably think of the likes of john o'shea who was you know he was a, a phenomenal player and a phenomenal man and he had such an amazing career and, and to get an opportunity to play with john at uh, at irish level and like that as well, we all have, I suppose, perceptions of players and what people are actually like before we actually meet them and play with them. And, you know, John just blew my mind away when I actually got an, an opportunity to actually 
um, walk out onto a pitch with him and, and play alongside him because he was he was a phenomenal, phenomenal footballer. And he was definitely a player that was seriously underrated. And you look at what he won at Man United and everything else, he was he, because he was such a utility player. That's how good he was. You could, you could put John anywhere. Probably stick him in goals. He probably wanted to win goals for the penalties. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, John, John was phenomenal. Richard Dunn. Richard Dunn was was unbelievable. Anytime we had a five aside, and his pace and power for such a big man was 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 awesome. And I remember like that getting to know him and getting getting to see him in training. And you'd be talking to players right shoulder, right shoulder, get tight, get tight, and he'd just give you a little thumb up, like, and it'd make you feel really uncomfortable. And you'd be thinking, he's there, like he's he's in, he's in. <laughs> and next thing, ball goes from boom, and he's over there and across there, and you're absolutely going. Geez, this guy's an absolute steam train. Like, you know, he just had his style and the way he played. And it was all like under control. And yeah, he was he was phenomenal. Seamus Coleman was I, I couldn't leave Seamus out there. Seamus was so um intense. He was like a little terrier. He was just loved the winner. He had a great attitude and he was a, a phenomenal just marauding up and down the sideline. James McCarthy was exceptional, especially as you said, when it came to um, five side games and even first team games and I, I still don't believe that he probably fulfilled his his potential as of yet because he's probably one of the most composed footballers and probably the best touch I've ever seen if he just absolutely glued to his toe and Wes Hoolan absolute little magician and he's still smashing it at Cambridge my old yeah. club at, at the weekend and he's I think he's man the match every week at 38, 39 and like that he was a late developer coming from the League of Ireland same as myself and him in a five side no joking that was he was he was magic and he was magic on 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 the pitch as well like he did so well for Norwich for so many years and um he was a little genius you know he was a little magician and then Robbie Keane Robbie Keane up front was was you know an absolute goal machine and just watching his movement and and watching how he moved and his level of finishing and his ability to finish was was sublime so um yeah there's 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 so many players I I I could go on to like you know even playing with Steve Morrison at Millwall he was he was he was massive for us at the time, and there was there's so many so many players that you could you could pick from and choose from. So I think I've named seven aside teams instead of <laughs> five aside teams. Yeah, you're allowed Counting, a couple of substitutes. Counting wasn't always my strongest point. Okay, so for this next part of the show, we've got tweet of the week, and what we do here is we take a tweet um, which we find on Twitter. Um, and discuss our thoughts and opinions um, and share some insight and experience and knowledge around that tweet, okay? So this week's Tweet of the Week is, given the disruption of the past two seasons, will the FA support the notion that age groups are held in their current playing formats for the next season? So, Gerald, what are your thoughts on that, first of all? Obviously, COVID's had a massive impact on grassroots football, and this has obviously come from potentially a grassroots football coach, um, probably at a younger age group if we're thinking about formats of the game. Um, but yeah, what's your initial thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's definitely something needs to be done um, or, or looked into, you know, doing something just because, you know, you don't want those players to, to miss any learning outcomes, you know, in that age group or a certain format that they might be playing, whether it be 7v7, 9v9 or anything like that. So it's hugely important for me personally to, to maybe even keep you know, the same format, whether they're going up at age group or not. Um, I think if you are transitioning into that nine aside to 11 aside, maybe you can look into maybe doing like friendly matches. Um, so there's less pressure for them to perform in 11 aside or maybe like, um, yeah, training matches or anything like that for them just to get a feel of it. And then maybe the, the season, the next season, they, they, they'll they probably go into like a competition for 11 aside. Um you don't want to add that pressure to them, do you know what I mean, to perform and, yeah. and not get the learning outcomes from the year before the, or two years before um, in their age group. And I think the other day I was watching a talk um, Van Nistelrooy did, I think it was with the Oxford yeah. University, um, where he was talking about, you know, young players. And, and again, it comes down to education where in Holland, they do the 3v3s up to, I think, I'm not too sure exactly, but it's, it's up to like a under sevens or something like that where they do the 3v3s. Three three, three um, so I think in this country, we're too, um, I don't know if the word is correct, but obsessed in terms of it has to be this way. It's got to be this way. We've got to do 7v7 if they get to this age group. But really and truly, again, I agree with Ruud Van Nistelrooy where he was saying to the age of 13, 14, 
that's when it starts to, to become a little bit more serious. And some kids play so much football before that age, where once they get to 13, 14, they sometimes lose the love for it because they've played so much football where it's rigid, it's, it's got to be this way or, you know, um, till that age, I think you can play a, a 8v8 or a 7v7 or 6v6 or even down to a 4v4, whatever. As long as they're playing yeah. football, they're getting contact on the ball consistently um, until they get to that age. For me personally, I think it should be all fun and games and things like that and just help them to get familiar with the ball, um, familiar with like, you know, certain situations, receiving the ball, um, things like that. For me, that's the most important part. And, you know, yeah, hopefully, you know, the FA do something about it because it's, um, it's, it's hugely important for the, de- for the long-term development for these players. Yeah, agree. I, I think it's an interesting one. So when I saw this tweet, I kind of, it kind of made me think in two aspects, really. So first of all, I thought, well, I wouldn't have even considered that. It was only because, mm. you know, somebody put that tweet out there yeah. and it made me think, well, yeah, should they? Should they be allowed to go mm. back a few stages? Now, number one, I agree with you. I think that too many times within coaching, within football, everything's too structured. Mm. Um, now, we talk quite heavily in coaching about um, organised chaos, you know, mm. and your random practices. Now, obviously, we're talking about games here, but when you talk about random, randomised practices, it looks a mess from the outside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and from a parent's perspective or an observer's perspective, you know, it's what on earth is going on? You know, there's a lot <laughs> of people running around. There's no structure to it. However, mm-hmm. you then look at it from the other aspect and you think to yourself, well, you know, if, in, in terms of this question, which this person's put out there, you look at the ages it will affect. So we're talking about under nines, potentially up until about the age of under 13. Now, in my yeah. eyes, from about the age of 10, 11, 12 anyway, um, you should, well, potentially you may have experienced football over a longer period of time if you started out mm-hmm. when you were young. But at that yeah. age, you're starting to become a decision maker anyway and a problem yeah, solver yeah. anyway. So when you look at how nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds play football, apart from in their structured and organised sessions, they're actually playing, like I always compare it to schools. If you go into a school and you watch yeah. them at lunchtime or break time, it's 30 to 30 Half of them are wearing trainers. Half of them are wearing school shoes. They're playing on a cobbled ground, which... 20 you know, defenders. Yeah, 20 defenders. We've <laughs> got about 10 people in goal and you've got yeah. one person who just runs with the ball. So yeah. when you look at it in that aspect, like you said, actually, you know, we're trying to develop footballers here. Obviously, mm. game knowledge and game understanding is important. Don't get me wrong. But they see that through watching games. They see that, like you said, potentially through, uh, obviously, experience of playing. But I agree. I think it could be done through tournaments. I think it could be done through friendlies. I think it could be done within in-house yeah. as well. I mean, you know, if you don't want to go and travel and play uh, a seven-a-side or a 11-a-side or a nine-a-side because it's not in your league structure, we'll do that within in-house then. Do it within your own clubs mm-hmm. or your own friendlies. I think you're right in terms of the structure side of things. I think we're so structured and we yeah. have to almost follow a routine. I remember when I was doing my uh, university degree, and um, one of the subjects was on about sort of like, you know, why things are the way they are in football. And someone mentioned the question, I think it was a, a, an author, and they said something about the reason behind why football is at three o'clock on a Saturday. And it's because apparently back in the day, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of years ago, um, you know, people would finish work and yeah. then that's when they would then go and play football. But why has it never been changed? Mm-hmm. And like you said, when like people like, you know, you read Van Nistelrooy's people with, you know, stature behind them, and they put out these questions of, you know, why are things done in the way in which they are? Mm. Um, and I think that when you get more experienced people, more experienced clubs like Ajax, yep. these things start to take change. And people don't question it as much because it comes from experienced head or loud voices. But mm. I think it's giving people opportunity just to say, look, we'll do this in this way. And almost not questioning it, going with it and seeing the outcomes because... I think with all sorts of things, when you trial and error things, they have different outcomes, not always ones which you expect in a way. Mm, mm. No, I agree with you, definitely. I think, again, that's something that I've developed as a coach, you know, um, coaching abroad, coaching in different um, situations where, you know, you want, as a coach, you want the session to be so organised that it looks like an orchestra and everything's done perfectly. But when you watch a match, Nine times out of ten, sometimes things like goals will happen from the balls hit a defender, it's ricocheted off the other defender, it's come off this, and it's like the the striker's just instincts just taking a ball and he scored. So it's like 
having that organized chaos sometimes is it is important to have, you know, and I feel like I've developed that as a coach where it's like sometimes I don't need the session to look like it's under control. I know it's under control, you know, to other people might be like, what is he doing? Regardless, anyway, whether the session was organized or not, you're always going to have someone to say, oh, I'm not too sure about that. You know, I'm not too sure I would do that. You're always going to get opinions. So why not just go with what you feel most comfortable with? Do you know what I mean? And if it is for you to feel like, you know, I need it to be organized. This is how I want it to be. And, you know, players respond to it. Then they're still getting a learning outcome for it. I just feel like, again, it's, there's too much of this. It has to be this way. If you're not doing it this way, then you're doing it wrong. Where, well, no, because football is a matter of opinions. You know, you can't yeah. tell me that, you know, this player is the best player in the world. I might have a different opinion to the point where, is it Messi or Ronaldo? Like, there's two great players and we're still debating who's better. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, yeah, for me, it's different. And, and going back to one of the questions where we spoke about um, managers and things like that, um, especially like young coaches in, in the UK, I feel it's important for coaches to step out of their comfort zone, to go to different countries, to see things in a different way. Whereas... Look at David Moyes at the moment where he's actually doing really well with West Ham. Was he a good manager before? Yes, he was. Do you know, did he have a good time at Man United? Not the best. Should he have got more time? Probably. But he stepped out of his comfort zone. He went to yeah. Spain. Again, did he have the best time over there? Probably not. But then it goes back to the whole conversation that we had earlier on where what is success? What is development? Where has he come back as a better manager? Of course you know, 100% to, he, he knows how to deal with different cultures probably be, um, better. He's probably learned so much things from the Spanish game where he's implemented, you know, into West Ham because West Ham don't look the same West Ham back in the days. They can actually yeah. play some football at the moment. So I'm not saying he's learned that from Spain, but there could be a possibility where he's learned those, you know, uh, I don't know, techniques or style of coaching from there. So it's all about stepping out of the comfort zone. And this is why we probably see more continental managers coming into the Premier League because they have so many different variations of coach in different countries. We spoke about Carlo Angelotti. This guy's coached in Germany, Italy, Spain, you know, England. So he's got that. Mourinho, same thing. Um, yeah. Jurgen Klopp, obviously he's done Germany and now he's done England, but he's still in his progression to, to get into... He's the best manager for me anyway, not being biased because I spoke to him and that, but yeah, I feel like he's the best manager. But yeah, no, just going back to, to that, Pep Guardiola, uh, Spain, and it's not just managing. These managers go and do study visits. They'll go to different yeah. countries. Uh, the Brendan Rodgers, the reason why he is so good at the moment, he's still developing because he does so many study visits. He goes to different countries to look at how things are done. Um, and I feel this is another thing that you know young managers or young coaches whether it'll be an elite or grassroots whatever go out there there's so much opportunities for you to go to another country for three months six months now obviously everyone's commitments are different if, if you can do that you can if you can't do that then it doesn't mean it's the end of the world you can still you know learn things you know we, we're, we're blessed to have the internet look at us we're having conversations we're not even in the same room yeah. so you can definitely reach out to other managers or coaches and just say can I have I don't know, 20 minutes of your time and just can we speak about, you know, um, creating from the back or whatever, do you know what I mean? And see from their perspective, this is another coach that's maybe coaching in Argentina, who knows, yeah. um, that might give you a different insight. So, yeah, man, there's there's, there's so much variables to, um, yeah, just being a coach and, and it just depends where you want to go with it as well, to be fair. Yeah. I think, I think as well, again, made a very good point there in terms of um, reaching out to other people. I think especially with, like I said, this tweet that's obviously come up that, you know, really and truthfully, things are going to be out of your control, number one. Mm. You know, uh, you can't control the uncontrollables. And it may just be points to coaches who are in those sort of similar situations or are facing that situation where their players are going to have to step up to a different type yeah. of format in, in, in play. Um, but yeah, they talk to other managers, other coaches. How do you deal with it when your players mm -hmm. went up to there? You know, what yeah. are other managers and coaches going through at the moment? Um, and I think, like I said, controlling the controllables is one thing. But mm -hmm. also as well, you mentioned it similarly to um, sort of the David Moyes effect and, you know, linking it back into this tweet is, you know, looking at the positives within the negatives. 
So if this does happen and if players um, have to go up into a different format of playing and they've missed out one altogether, so they've gone from under seven and straight up to under yeah. 11s, then do you know what? Look at the positives. Well, number one, bigger goals. Bigger goals yeah. means... Uh, more opportunities at scoring goals, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. bigger pitches. Bigger pitches means more opportunity to actually dribble with the ball and run with the ball, mm-hmm. um, more time and space to think on the ball. So I'd say that, yeah, I think with things like this, it's, you know, controlling the controllables, which are you're able or you're unable to do, um, and also taking the positives, like you said, out of those negatives and just looking forward to it and then almost, almost being like a player, make decisions, mm-hmm. problem solve, within those scenarios and within those situations. At the end of the day, you know, it's just another opportunity for a player to learn whether they've missed out on an opportunity, like you said, going back into yeah. it, training, competitions, absolutely fine. But again, it's just another decision that players have to make in a different type of format. So mm. it's an interesting one. But again, people who are listening and viewing, obviously put your comments down below. Let us know what you think. Um, you know, should the FA potentially put a halt on people's uh, playing formats or should players just maybe potentially, I say get on with it, but I mean, in terms of just get on with the next format of play um, and then sort of face the problems, uh, solve the problems which will come at that format. So, yeah, let us know what you think. Cool. So for the next part of the show, um, I give the coach who's with me on the day a challenge, okay? And it's going to be based in a session, a part of a session around a specific outcome, objective or topic, okay? So today I've given uh, Gerald the uh, opportunity to plan a session and a challenge of planning a session all around a mixed ability, new, newly formed under 11s grassroots side, okay? And I've given him the openness and freedom to uh, plan any part of a session, um, and see what he comes out with. And then we can talk around why he's chosen that specific session for that specific um, outcome and objective. So I have gone for, it's, it's a pretty straightforward session in terms of um, set up um, the organization part of it. Um, so it's a, it's a 2v2 um, with progression to, and when I say 2v2, you've got goalkeepers on each end. Don't think, Let's not forget the goalkeepers. So we've got, Basically, it could be a 3v3 in a way, wherever, however your um, setup is in terms of the size of the pitch, what area you've got available. Um, now, as it's a newly formed team and it's a mixed age, uh, mixed ability of the team, um, for me personally, I'd like to see where the players are um, as we spoke in terms of like creativity, um, their mindset, um, and just kind of see an overview of how they play under pressure as well. Um, and that's something for me that's important rather than saying, oh, okay, you're a defender, you're a midfielder. I kind of want to give them that freedom to play um, and then see what, what, where we come up from from that. Um, so the setup again, so we've got two goals. Um, you have some footballs. Um, you can either use poles or cones. Um, again, if you don't have this, um, you can be creative. So you can have, um, instead of the poles, you can have the cones. Um, instead of goals, you can have gates where you can have, again, um, two gates in either side um, so yes it's totally up to you um, again for bibs if you don't have any bibs you can try and just put teams into um, as organised as you can I guess um, but yeah you can be creative with, with how you want to go about it um, so there'll be four groups um, so again there'll be two, two groups facing each other and other two, two groups facing each other um, in front of them, they have the pole, which on the coaches um, say when he, when he shouts out goal, players will run out uh, and the coach will play out to either player um, to get the ball and try and play on a 2v2 using a goalkeeper as well um, to try and score a goal. Um, to, to change it up again, what we spoke about in terms of giving players that that freedom, that creativity, um, so the players on the opposite ends, you can either run across diagonal to the other pole. Um, that way it gives them a different opportunity to be in a different part of the pitch, um, see things in a different picture. How do you handle this situation? Maybe your, your back is phased towards the opposition goal. So maybe do we start again? Can we start um, from the back? So using a goalkeeper again, finding out different ways um, or... You can go across to your other uh, teammates' pole, again, using a different angle, different variation to, to receive the ball. Um, and then also you can let the players have the freedom 
to wherever they want to run to towards making the run. So, for instance, over here, this player that's making a run, um, if they want, can they go diagonal? Uh, the, the player from his team, he can go over here. So, again, it gives them that different... It, it looks like a mess. Again, if you look watching from the outside in, you're thinking, what is going on? But, again, it gives the players a different freedom, that creativity to, to understand, you know, where to go, where not to go. Um, and, again, just that freedom. Um, if they want to, they can go to the opposite pole, um, run around that and receive the ball. Um, and, you know, I've done this session before and, and I've seen that the players really love it. There's the intensity, especially when you add, um, you know, things like maybe a time limit to score. Um, you know, the, the, the attacking team has probably, I don't know, you can say 20 seconds, 10 seconds, up to you. If they don't score within that, um, the defending team can have another player coming in to the to the game so you have a, a 3v2 um scenario so again that adds more um chaos or problem solving for the attacking team how can we try and beat this or you know the defending team now how do we organize ourselves now we've got uh, a numeral i can't say the word sorry but the advantage of more players um how do we how do we cope with that um how do we try and win the ball back um again the goalkeepers you know, how are the, what information are they given? How many times can we use the goalkeeper starting from the back? You can even add things like if you use the goalkeeper, you get extra point. There's so many different variations that you can that you can add to this small session where it looks so simple, but you get so much outcomes. Um, and then adding the whole competition fun element to it, you know, first team to score 10 goals wins the game. You know, maybe the other team has a forfeit where, you know, the players can come up with a forfeit and things like that. So, it, you know, it brings that social aspect to it. So, yeah, one, to be honest with you, this is one of my favourite, um, like, sessions that I always do because, yeah, the players really respond to this. And um, you could either... It's, it's totally up to you. Again, for me, as it's a, it's a, it's a newly formed team, uh, mixed, eight, mixed ability, I would use this as a as a, as my situational. This is what we used to call it at the Juventus Academy. So we had the you know the warm up, which included the um, uh, SAQs, maybe ball mastery, things like that. You get into a technical aspect um, where it's unopposed, and then the situational when it's on a when it's um, opposed, and then your your match. So we used to call it situational um, at Juventus. So yeah, in terms of the four corners, um, the physical aspect, trust me, is very demanding. If it's consistent and it's you know the ball's flowing and and things like that, the players will be will be tired. I, I guarantee you that. Um, but again, it's it's keeping them engaged, keeping them um, you know on their toes at all times. Um, you know, for me again, having lines and things like that, it, it's I don't I'm not the biggest fan of them. Um, I remember when I was at Juventus, there was a lot of times where they used um, lines and things like that. Um, which at first I was like, I, I'm, I'm not too sure about this. But again, it it's organised until you add these different elements to it. So again, the, you know, the ball roll, ball rolling time, um, giving them the freedom to, to, to kind of take ownership of the session and adding these different elements of they make the decision on which pole that they want to run around or, you know, things like that. Because this player might roll, run around this pole this player might run around this pole and it's like, I don't know, maybe the coach can give it to this player. He sets it off. He can have a strike. There's so many different variations to it. Um, in terms of the technical aspect, again, consistently there's dribbling, passing, um, shooting as well. I feel, you know, sometimes when I, when I, for my session, I always try and have a goal and, and especially in the, you know, again, the situation as we call it, um, just because at the end of the day, the outcome of football is to score goals, you yeah. know? So if we're not teaching that, then, you know, for me, it's a bit, not that it's pointless, but there needs to be an outcome. So, and again, like I said, if you don't have goals, you can have a different outcome where you could have two gates here, two gates here. If you've got cones or even one gate here, you don't have to use the goalkeepers where players have to dribble through the gates or, you know, have a play on the other side for them to pass it through the gate. So again, it's about being creative as a coach and, and being resourceful with, with what's around you. Um, so yeah, and the technical aspect, again, there's so many different variations that you get, you can get and outcomes that you can get from this session. Um, in terms of the social aspect, once, you know, the, 
the you give them the freedom again it, it gives them that that fun element you know the the social aspect of working in the team um you know trying to find strategies maybe some a lot of times when i when i've done this session i've seen you know the, the pairs talk to each other and they're like you run to that pole i'll run to this pole and it's like working in teams and things like that um and sometimes i've heard teams say you know what we're going to sit back and get that extra defender coming in to attack them once we win the ball back um so yeah it's just interesting to see the different variations of players and things like that um to to, to come into it and, and of course you know the competition element to it as well will add to it um you know sometimes teams you know best of 10 or best of five you have different rounds and and things like that so you know again from such a simple setup um such a simple way of 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 coaching there's so many elements that you can get to it again this is a this is one way that i'll do it in terms of a newly formed team just to see you know how do players react to certain situations you know different um parts of the pitch, etc. cetera. Um, I wouldn't use this all the time, but it's definitely a fun way to, um, to engage with players, especially when it's a new team. And even if it's your team, you know, I've used this sometimes as, as when I, when I, once I've finished doing my warm up, I've done this with my, you know, my elite teams, my advanced teams. And, you know, they really love this aspect because, you know, they want to win. They want it. It's that competition aspect for them. So yeah, again, small, small, simple, sometimes, is the most effective in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think what I really like about the session as well is that, you know, it's realistic in terms of, you know, you've got it on a pitch, obviously depending on potentially the area of size that you're actually going to be using and whether or not you're going to have, say, for example, um, you know, your five side pitch or your seven side pitch or your nine side, wherever it may be, you know, you're replicating movements that'll be done on the actual pitch itself. Uh, yeah. um, and I think what's important as well, for when it's like a newly formed team, I think this is one reason why I want to give you this challenge to, for coaches really to consider and think, you know, obviously I'm coaching them football, but I really need to consider those social aspects because yeah. if you've never played with someone before, sometimes it can be quite a daunting task. Um, mm -hmm. but I think what I really like about your session is I always consider the social aspects to be with slash against so, you know, understanding how to work with somebody else, but also having the opportunity to work individually. So, you know, just because they have a, it's a 2v2, it doesn't necessarily mean that it kills your creativity and you can't yeah. do it by yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then at the same time, you obviously have the opportunity to pass it to somebody if you need to and combine with them. Um, mm -hmm. But then on the other aspect, competition, like you said, I think fun ways of engaging players um, who don't know each other or who maybe are of that mixed ability having competition in there is such a key way to bring that out, I think, mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. you know, it just, number one, raises the levels a little bit. Number two, it gives some people a target or an objective to work towards, let alone, obviously, the actual session outcome itself. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, like I said, it just raises the game. And I really like the point as well you make about the goal aspect. I think, you know, ultimately, you know, we try and include the three areas, in possession, out possession, transition, well, you've got all of those, you know, you've got the in-possession stuff of what is the ultimate aim of football? Score goals. Um, out of possession, what's the ultimate aim? Win the ball. You know, transitional yeah. effect, how do we change and, and, and affect that? Um, with that point as well, um, in terms of, like I said, the newly formed teams or even with mixed yeah. abilities, how important do you feel it is to have sort of individual challenges as well as those group challenges or progressions? Because, again, we see so many coaches who maybe put uh, progressions in there yeah. but you know say for example if you've got a, two people working in there two and one of them's really advanced and one of them's mm. maybe not as advanced how would you sort of overcome with that that issue yeah I think I think the individual aspect of you know challenges is hugely as well again you could you could use uh, something different prior to this where you can do um, yeah just individual tasks to, to try and see where they're at and maybe from there you can gauge you know maybe this player can go with this player or or even give them the opportunity to make that decision and say you know what you know um team up in in pairs or things like that where you know they've made the decision i'm going to be with this person anyway but if it is a situation where you feel there's a player that's more advanced than the other then I wouldn't say split them because I don't want the other player to feel like, you know, maybe I'm not good enough. Yeah. Maybe just have a word with the other, maybe the stronger player and, and just see, you know, ask him the question, how can we get, you know, maybe Timmy, how can we get Timmy a bit more involved, you know, to try and, you know, feel, feel, make him feel, not make, make him feel, but how can we try and use Timmy to, you know, 
used to me as a player to maybe do a one-two, not maybe sometimes yeah. just be the player all the time because in a situation, uh, in a game situation, not you're not always going to have the opportunity to go past the player. So it's like sometimes just maybe pulling the player to the side or maybe just walking over to him while he's waiting or, or, or she's waiting and just saying, you know, you know, how can we use can we use Timmy to do a one two next time? You know, every time you do that, um, I'll give you an extra point for you. Do you know what I mean? Or for your team and things like that. So it's just like, yeah, can, try and be creative as much as you can as a coach. And I feel that comes with time. That comes yeah. with with experience on the grass. You know, again, going back to what we spoke about the voluntary hours. That's vital because that's where you can make the most mistakes. And you know, people are not going to look at you and feel like, oh, what are you doing? Like at the end of the day this is you're, you're getting your coaching hours in. So I'd say, yeah, sometimes it's about experience and finding out what makes players work, what doesn't make players work. Um, and yeah, no, I enjoyed the challenge of, of doing that as well of, you know, just because I've seen again, a lot of, and even myself, if I speak about myself, when I first started coaching, you think about all these different um, sessions and thinking, yeah, I'm going to get the ball here. This player is going to receive in the back foot. I'm going to play into the middle play. He's going to receive in the back foot to spray it out wide 30 yards. He's going to dribble past the left back. He's going to cross it in and he's going to shoot and score. But they're not ready yet. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. They're not ready to do all that stuff. So especially when it comes to a new form team, um, it's important to find out the characteristics. So the whole social aspect is is huge. I think that's what you said earlier on is, is the most important part for me as well is finding out the social aspects. Um, and from there you can kind of gauge, you know, people's strong points or areas for them to improve. Yeah, totally. I think as well, like, you know, obviously number one, thank you for taking up the challenge. And I think, you know, it's interesting because again, like you said, a lot of coaches, they overcomplicate things. Number one, number two, you ask anybody to think about a session, the first thing that they'll think of is the technical aspects, let yeah. alone even the structure or yeah. who they're actually working with. And I think the good thing is, like you mentioned it in your um, explanation of the session, um, that, you know, you've kept it quite simple. And I think the mm. good thing with keeping things simple is sometimes people think, you know, simple, is that going to be effective? Yeah, yeah simple is effective. And mm. the thing is, what it allows you to do, I mean, you've set it up in a 2v2 structure, but, you know, we're saying obviously potentially if you have a player who's maybe um, of a lower ability level or somebody who's really higher ability level, well, there's nothing stopping people from doing a session like that and then going, well, do you know what? The higher ability player, you're doing a 1v2. 1v2, you know, yeah. The, the, the one who's are the uh, lower ability levels, you need a bit more confident. Who's a really mm. good friend of yours within the team? Oh, you mm. like that player, but you're not working with them? Brilliant. Join them in, 3v2. So it's all those different aspects. And I think, like you said, the, the, the understanding of how to build those relationships through uh, com competition, like you mentioned, mm. through um, working with and against people, um, and also through just uh, like seeing what's going on. I think that's mm. really, really the key of helping people to build uh, relationships, form relationships, not only with players, but also with coaches as well. I think, you know, like you said, it gives you a pretty, pretty good opportunity because the sim session is so simple in terms of mm. the running of it that you can then sit back a little bit sit and observe back. and see what's going on and see how it develops and, and understand the players that you have for your team. So, yeah, no, like I said, I think no, great session. Sure. Um, no, in fact, I think, I think again, sorry to cut you off there, David, but I think, again, even the age group that, uh, which we spoke about on the 11s, I feel, uh, which we spoke about a bit earlier on, um, it's, a, it's an age group where they still should be having fun, should be having, you know, the, the opportunity to problem solve themselves rather than having a coach to dictate the whole session and say, you need to run here, make sure you do the overlap, etc. And then there will, be, there will be times in that session where you can go and coach, you know, and say, you know, maybe look at this uh, position, you know, maybe body shape. Um, can we use a goalkeeper a little bit more to kind of create that overload in terms of yeah, when we have possession? Like there's so many different variables that you can do within that. But first and foremost, at that age group for me, it's still about them enjoying themselves, having fun, creating problems for them to solve themselves. Um, yeah. And again, just creating that, that competition for me is it, it, it's important, you know, to, to do that from young because, well, around that age, I feel like it's a little bit more important because they're starting to understand now, you know, the concept of scoring a goal, conceding a goal, you know, what it means, what it doesn't mean. Um, so, yeah, man. No, I enjoy so I think that it's Good, man. I like it. Because, again, I think as we said, the under-11 team or side, that, you know, at a certain age, you're probably up until about under-10, you're taught yeah. 
dribble with the ball, master the ball, yeah. you know, uh, move with the ball, all these sort of things. And then when you get to about the age of 11, it's, yeah, you're suddenly starting to think about your combining, you're thinking about yeah. your game understanding of, yeah. I need to dribble the ball to go and score a goal. I need to pass mm-hmm. the ball and combine with others to get around people. So, yeah. yeah, but no, listen, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And like I said, I think a fantastic session. And obviously, again, anybody listening and watching, um, you know, I welcome you into uh, not judging the session, but putting your opinions on the session and think about how you may adapt it um, what progressions or challenges you may add into it um, and maybe how you can make it relevant for your team as well. So again, please make sure that you do put those comments down below um, and share your thoughts and your opinions. So that's the end of the Daily Coaching Football Show. I just want to say a big, massive thank you for Coach Gerald Lammy for coming on today. There's been some fantastic insight and discussions around sort of, like I said, the football side of things, player and coach development as well. And obviously a fantastic uh, insight into a session two, which hopefully um, people who are watching and listening, they can take it away, use it for their own team or obviously adapt it as well. Um, Please make sure, as I've mentioned throughout, that you comment um, your thoughts, opinions um, below in the comments just so that we can see what you think on certain discussions and certain topics. Um, Please make sure, as always, you subscribe and like the video, subscribe to the channel. I please also welcome uh, Gerald to... uh, say some of his channels in which he's got going so you can check out some of the great stuff that he's doing. So Gerald, over to you. Yeah, now, f- firstly, thank you again, David, for having me. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was definitely one of my, my fun, um, well, one of the, the most exciting ones that I've done, to be fair, um, over Zoom. It's definitely been interesting. So, but yeah, um, in terms of my socials, you can um, you can, you can can hit me up on um, Instagram, coachgerald.lammy. Um, you can check me out on YouTube. I've got a few podcasts up on there. Um, Coach Gerald Lammy. Um, yeah, that's my main ones that I really use. You can hit me up on Twitter as well. Um, Coach Gerald Lammy on that. Um, but yeah, that's my socials. Super. Well, again, massive thank you. Listen, people, subscribe to this channel. Subscribe to Coach Gerald Lammy's channel. Um, follow him and hit him up on his socials as well. Um, and obviously, if you have any questions or anything like that, then obviously feel free to ask him. Very knowledgeable guy. Um, and very humble in terms of, you know, give you the time to, to speak and answer your questions as well. But um, anyway, thank you very much for joining me for the Daily Coaching Football Show. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Um, take care and I'll see you soon. <laughs>